Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Matan. Um, I can, I'm very happy to see the couple of faces that I can see. If I can put in a plea for you all to reveal yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. It really makes it much, much better when I can see a face um, and the face can see me and I can see myself being seen and so forth. Um, it, there is some sense of interaction then which is going to be important for our thinking today. Um, first of all, I want to dedicate uh, the share. It's dedicated by Joe Rich, Elui uh, Nishmata of his mother, Ellen Rich, Etka Leah Bad Shraga Shachna. That's the dedication. Um, as I emerge from a certain kind of silence into teaching, um, I just want to, to share with you how difficult that is. It's very difficult to sit here um, trying to explain something, trying in, to some, in some way to address where we all are. We are in a shared sara. We are all in, we're all together here. But in addition to being all together, we are all each separate. And there is an expression, a Talmudic expression, um, that the sages used that really applies to Noah to start with. It's applied to Noah and then to everyone else, metaphorically. And that is the expression, harav alav olamo. His world was destroyed for him. That is, it was his own particular experience that the whole world was uh, destroyed. It's one thing to say that God destroyed the world. You can say that in three, four words. But what, it, what that means is that for a particular human being, what has been lost is a whole world, everything. There's something very radical. And that became a kind of metaphoric expression that Chazal used for someone who has undergone radical radical disorientation so that in a way there is nothing recognizable anymore and it's very hard to speak it's very hard to gather one's thoughts together because one is not in a thoughtful situation not yet and it's very hard therefore to gather thoughts that should be meaningful that should be consoling um i think by the very nature of what we have experienced and are still experiencing now uh, there is a big gap between the reality and sitting before you now, sitting with you today, and trying to think and trying to speak, and trying to speak Divrei Torah. Divrei Torah is another world from the reality we are living in now. When you engage in Divrei Torah, then in a way that's a timeless occupation. You look at the Parsha, you look at the difficulties in it, you follow up different interpretations. There's a lot to say there. But the question that troubles me as I begin now is, will what comes out as we speak to Vrei Torah, will that in any way touch on our real reality? Will there be meeting points between what we study and where we are now? And there is no real way of knowing ahead of time. You know, I don't plan these things in order to fit a certain need. That here we are going to learn, and we're going to learn a parsha that turns out to be uncannily close to our situation. And so I'm just uh, introducing the subject of Noah and the flood with this per on this personal note. And what comes to my mind is a pasuk in it's a verse in Psalms. Uh, 77, where the psalmist says, Nif amti lo adaber. I have been, I'm clanging like a bell. <laughs> Nif amti pa'am. 
That is, I am under under pulses of experience. There is, I, I'm jolting with experience. There is this, and there is that, and and, and I, I'm constantly in restless. I'm cost, constantly confused on some level. I can't speak. Now, if the psalmist said that, and he says it many times, of course, in his psalms, because he is often in some kind of radical trouble. And that's the position from which he speaks. And the, the strange thing is that we look at psalms when we want comfort, when we want a way of expressing ourselves, when, when there is something inexpressible about what is happening. We borrow his words, which are based on speechlessness. They're based on the experience of, I'm struck dumb on some level. I can't really master that. And so that's how I wanted to, to, to begin as well. If we move into the material of Parshat Noach, indeed, a whole world is destroyed. And it's God's decision to destroy the world. God, who has created the world, that was last week, that was just last week, no time at all, as it were, has now looks, he now looks at the world and he sees what, if you look at the end of last week's Parsha, uh, chapter six, uh, verse eight, verse, verse five, I'm sorry. Vayar Hashem ki rabara ata adam ba'aretz. God saw. He looks at the reality of the world and he sees that great is the evil of human beings, ha'adam, of the human being on the earth. And all the thoughts of his heart are only evil all day long. So there's a kind of total, what God sees as total evil when he looks at the world. And we've seen a couple of narratives before this that give us a kind of sense of the kind of evil there is in the world in which no one respects the otherness of anyone else, in which people trample into each other's worlds and take over and there is violence and there is complete lack of the kind of respect that has, is necessary for a world. Vayinachim Hashem, and God changed his mind. He regretted. God has a moment of regret which is a very strange verb to use about the omnipotent, omniscient God. You know, is, is that a proper word for the Torah to use about God? That he, he regrets that he created the human being on the earth. Everything that he did in Parshat Breshit, in creating the human being and situating him in the world, on the earth as an earthly human being, all that has turned out to be a complete loss. Vayit atsev el libo. It's very absolute and very total. And it goes to the heart of God. And something impacts on the heart of God that makes him atsuv. But it's not sad, it's not just sad. Vayit atsev. It's in, in the Hitpael form. It doesn't just say he became sad. That would be sufficiently anthropomorphic. But how does Rashi translate it? If you have a look at number one on your source page, you have your source pages? Yes? Yeah, good. Um, number one is all about a verb, there are four parts to it, a, 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 a noun actually, which is it's a von and the ways it's used in the text up to this point. This is the last occasion. So if you look at 1D, the last quote uh, on, on your page, you can see it there. God is in mourning before he destroys the world. I think that's, it's, it's very poignant and very strange, isn't it? He's already, why does Rashi translate it that way? with the issue of mourning, as if God is here in deep mourning for the loss of the work of his hands. Every word of that, I think, has weight. That what God is mourning here is not, as it might be after the flood, the loss of the world, the loss of all life, you know, human life, animal life, everything. But before he actually performs that, 
He's already in mourning. For the loss of what? Ma'aseyadav. That is the creative act. That God's hands, as it were, as soon as you say that God has hands that created the world, again, you're crossing over a line. You're transgressing a, a line uh, of theological correctness, if you know what I mean. Uh, theologically correctness would, 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 would say a philosophical theological statement, properly considered, would not talk about God as having hands. Not that metaphor w w wouldn't occur to you. You might talk about the mind of God, which is actually no less meta no less anthropomorphic. But here you have the idea of it's a very human experience of the creator in the world, a human, a human creator who uses his hands as the medium between himself and some other reality that shapes that reality to his desire. Right? A human creator, someone who, who works with with clay, someone who works with paint, someone who sings, someone who writes poetry. Yeah. Everyone who deals with materials deals with it in order to fulfill a vision, a desire. That somewhere in me, I know, even if not very precisely, what I want when I, when I get hold of the material with my hands. And the hands now are trying to create in a way a kind of extension of myself, which is true of a human creator. A human creator, when I create a poem, I want to make my, myself the mere skeleton of my hand. What is that after all? It's a physical bone structure. I want to have it produce something meaningful in the world, will which will extend into the world my own imagination, my own desire. Right? That, that as far as human beings are concerned. And here Rashi doesn't hesitate to use the same expression about God. What is Vayit Atsev El Libo? God is disappointed in mourning at the failure of the work of his hands. So it's a different level of, 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 of divine emotion here. And in order to get the idea of what Itzavon is, I want to just trace it through number one very briefly because it's used over and over again in the story of creation and the disappointment with creation. What happens when suddenly what, what, what has been made doesn't look so good? It in a way is a kind of insult to the vision that the creator had. For instance, in number one, when God gives uh, Eve, Chava, uh, a curse after the sin, he says, I will greatly increase your itzavon, and you tend to think, and it's often translated, the birth pains, when you give birth, you will you will suffer in, in that. What does Rashi do here? He divides the sentence up into various parts. The later part does have to do with the pain of childbirth, the pain of pregnancy, but itzavon is a very specific uh, curse on Eve. Now that's a, an ominous generalization, which uh, the sages are not, uh, they don't hesitate to make use of. That is the pain of raising children. That is the sorrow of raising children. Sa'ar. As if that's just as universal as the difficulties of pregnancy and the pain of childbirth. And these are things that everyone knows, everyone recognizes. Everyone recognizes tsar gedul banim. That's a generality. What is that tsar? Not all children cause their, their parents so much pain, do they? And yet one has to admit that there is such a thing, that there was a vision when the child was born. There was a hope that was, was total. It, this is going to be the perfect child. It's going to be like me, but much, much better. He's going to be, be able to do different things from me in the world. And comes the real child. And then the parent has to come to terms with a certain level of, well, I don't know what the word is exactly, because, of course, uh, this varies enormously. But there's a certain distance. There's a gap between the vision and the product of the work. And that gap is, is itself one, I want to say. 
and you can trace it. For instance, in the next passage, B, you shall eat of the grass of the field. That is the curse to Adam. Rashi asks, what's the curse in that? So you'll eat of the vegetation of the field. There are very good herbs. They can be prepared for, for eating. That's not a curse. Why would you say that's a curse? That's a bracha. Here I've given you all the vegetation of the field. Um, yeah, that's that's a, that's part of a blessing later on, uh, before that. Ella, but what does it say here? It says, cursed to be the ground because of you, for you. You will eat of its products. You will eat of the products and you will curse. You have a sense that the ground is cursed. Why is that? Because you have, what comes up is thorns and thistles. When you have sown all kinds of good vegetables and pulse and all kinds of good food, and you expect the seeds to give you back from the ground, you, know, you put the seeds in the ground, you expect it to come back with what you ex with the expectation of the seed, what, what the seed should grow into. And that seemed a, a, a rational expectation, and suddenly something irrational happens. All you get is thorns and thistles, scrubby stuff. And that is a kind of insult to human creativity and human productivity and what the hand can do, what the hand expects to do in its contact with, with the earth. So in the realm of agriculture, in the realm of childbearing, there is this itzavon built in. And in the third passage, Noah is born. Right? And here we go, we get later in the story, we're still in, 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 uh, in chapter five now. Zeyinachamenu, his father says, his father says, this one will console us. Mima'asenu ume itzvon yadenu. From our deeds, from our creativity, from the things we've made, and from the disappointment of our hands. Itzvon yadenu. The frustration of our hands. And Rashi's comment on this is, as we, until Noah came to the world, there were no plowing instruments. It's very specific in Rashi's translation here. There were no plowing instruments. He's drawing on a Midrashic tradition here. And Noah is the one who will invent those implements, plowing implements. And in that sense, Noah is a real, he's a real breakthrough. He's a breakthrough child. The father somehow knows that this child is going to make life much easier for human beings. He's, so he's going to be a revolutionary inventor. He's going to invent things, technologies, which will make the cursed relation with the ground easier. He will relieve us. This is how Rashi then translates, this one will console us. He doesn't want to translate it that way because then if it's for Nechama, for consolation, then uh, he should be called Menachem, shouldn't he? That's uh, as Rashi says. But he's called Noach, which comes from a, it's a different root. And so he reads, Yenachamenu, Yaniach Mimenu. This one will make the work of our hands easier for us. This one will relieve us of some of the tension and the difficulty and the failures that are involved in trying to put and us when we work in the world, when we are homo faber, yeah, we are creative man. We are we are man who tries to make things, right? Not just to think, but to make things in the world, to follow our thought. There is an inevitable disappointment built into that work from the time of Adam and Chava. And Noah is supposed to roll back some of that because he will he will develop his skills of the hands to create technology. Right, so the skill of the hands, the, the, uh, the technological skill, skill to overcome the weaknesses of the hand. Till that time, people had to plow the ground with their hands. And you can imagine that's very, that's very tiresome, laborious work. And now suddenly it'll be It'll be easier. He'll be uncursing the cursed world. He will have a, an ameliorative effect on the world. And that's what his father expects from him. He has some kind of prophecy. We don't know. There are different speculations. And who is born, what is what is born to his father is a ben. He's one of the few 
it was very, very rare to have a, a baby called a Ben before you give him give his name, a son. And Rashi says on that, a Ben Shemimenu Nivne Haolam. Why was he called a Ben? Because he is the one who will rebuild the world. Now these are all glimpses of the future. That before the flood, he developed technology to change the conditions, the basic conditions of work in the world. And after the, after the flood, he would be the sole survivor, he and his family, from which a new world could be created. So there's something about Noah that takes a grim reality and begins to redeem it somewhat. Somewhat, a great deal, I don't know exactly. Um, I, it's very nice to see all your names. Um, I, I will put in another plea for those who weren't here yet at the beginning. If you can show yourselves on screen, if it uh, if it's physically and uh, decorously possible for you to show yourselves on screen, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, it just makes it a little, there's more of a sense of a relationship. Thank you very much. Um, so here we are then with all these examples of that frustration in the world that has to do with trying to make things, and it starts with God. God is the creator, and God has a kind of radical, it comes a moment when he is radically disillusioned of his vision. If you go on, look back now at, at the um, passage at the end of Breshit, when God looks at the world in this doleful, in this doleful way. Um, Perik, Perik Vav, sorry, Perik Hei Pasuk Zayin, after God has, is in mourning for the work of his hands, Vayitatsev el libo, Vayomer Hashem emche et adam God said, I will now obliterate man, I will totally destroy man, whom I have created from upon the face of the earth from the human to the animal to the creeping creatures to the crawling creatures to the birds of the heaven is a kind of total mechia, wipeout it's a total wipeout of all life it's a very a very total word limchot no exceptions kini khamti ki asiti and here is god saying in his own voice what we've already heard in the in the narrator's voice because I am sorry I ever created them. Now that, it couldn't be more total than that. God, there's no exceptions possible. Why are there no exceptions possible? The Or Chaim, one of the very great commentaries on the Torah, 18th century, uh, Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic and literary commentary on the Torah, says something that struck me very much. There could be a kind of a notion of total destruction of destruction of the world that has to do with the fact that man has done evil, man is doing human beings are doing evil, and, and evil people deserve to be destroyed. You know, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. But then normally you would think, but what if someone was good? If there's an exception, someone who's a child, someone who is, a, who is an outstandingly good person. And we haven't yet heard of such a person. God looks at the world and he has a vision of absolute, absolute corruption, absolute wrong. But what if it seems that there's a difference between these two possibilities? One is a destruction of the world that would be just because of human evil. And of course, if there is an exception, you will allow for that exception and it won't be a total destruction. But what's happening here is something else, obviously. It's, it's as we said before, that why, why does God decide that he is, he is in mourning for the work of his hands and not simply angry with sinners? Because he has given up on the whole concept of the world, of the whole concept of this kind of world, which is based on the Aretz, you know, Adam Ba'aretz, that kind of connection. God had a vision of what might be possible. And if you follow Midrashic, this theme in Midrashic literature, uh, some you can find a lot of it through Rashi. If you know Rashi well, you can really trace it. I'll just point to one, one or two moments. 
even before God's decision, this total summary decision, even before God had hesitations about the world. Lo yadun ruchi olam. My, I can't go on any longer. It's uh, if you want to find it in the text. Uh, I didn't. Uh, it's it's uh, chapter six, verse three. And God said, Lo yadun ruchi ba'adam olam. My spirit, it cannot continue oscillating, uncertainly moving from one side to the other about this human being because he is flesh, even though he is flesh. That, uh, what is God saying there according to Rashi? I can't go on hesitating and I'm being ambivalent about the human being very much longer. That is, I have already be found myself, God says, again, a very anthropomorphic expression. I felt ambivalent about what I have done in the world here for quite a long time already. And sometimes I think this, and sometimes I think that. There is Midat Din and there's Midat Rachamin. In Kabbalistic vision, those are two of the two, the two sides of the character of God, of the structure of God's being. On the one hand, there is strict judgment, and on the other hand, there is, there is compassion. And I've been hesitating between the two all along. And that sense of God as capable of ambivalence, that's the word we would use now, again, humanizes God almost uncomfortably. For some people, it's quite uncomfortable. This sense, why, why does Rashi do it? Taking off from the Kabbalah, or I understand Kabbalah is a specialized area, but Rashi imports it into his text over and over again. And he, he, he relies on it very much that, because, because the text, you can't ignore it in the text. How do you have this hesitation illustrated at its most dramatic, right where we are now at the end of Parshat Breshit? Where God says, um, sorry, where God says, I'm going to totally destroy my whole concept of the world. This world as it is will, cannot continue being. Could be, couldn't be more total. And then you have that strange half pasuk at the end. The Noach matzachin be'ene Hashem. Have you ever noticed that strange pasuk? It's not a complete pasuk. Normally, you would have it in an etnachta there. You'd have a, a semicolon and then the second part of the pasuk. This is like a, it hangs in the air. A kind of suspended hope for the future. Nevertheless, Noah was liked by God. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. There was an exception, after all. Now, when you say there was an exception, Against the background of God's total decision, God is God. God can come to a to a final decision. He makes a choice here, and then it turns out that he mitigates the choice, like a human being who is in some way swayed by some kind of matzachin, which in itself is a very it's a very weak expression. If you know what I mean, it's not saying, as God will say later, you are a tzaddik. You are the exception. It's as if God simply looks at Noah and softens and says, mm, no. And in that moment, according to the Orachayim, according to his reading, what God is doing is rolling back a bit of that total judgment. God is no longer going to discard the possibility of this kind of world coming back. God could have decided, I'll build, if I want to build another world, I'll build it from a very different basis. I'll find some other more reliable uh, basis for a different kind of world, you know, like a like creator, like someone who's written a great, what he hoped would be a great, uh, a great, uh, a great poem, and then basically gives up on it. He looks at it and he says, now this is really, really not working. This is not at all what I want. And so he screws up the bit of paper and throws it away. And then he may, he may try again. If he tries again, he'll usually try something different. 
But God has decided here it's not going to be totally different. Even if I do decide to create another world, I'm going to take something of this world, a she'erit of this world. I'm using the word very deliberately. A leftover, a remnant of this world and use it as the basis. You know, I'm going to send it away in a spaceship, in a box, in an ark, whatever, a teva, and preserve it through the storms of a year, the year, the storms of that of 12 months, so that the same kind of attempt that I made before can start again in this world. Now that is, that's a decision of Rachamin. That's no longer total din. That's a way of saying, I haven't given up. We've just read that he had given up. He was mourning. And now he says, well, actually, no. You know, there, there's not total mourning here. And we see it enacted in real time. It's not, we, it's not as if we just have God saying very smoothly, well, you are the exception. And therefore, I, what happens in the next, in the next uh, the beginning of our Parsha is that when this destructive process is already well, very well decided in 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 God's mind, um, uh, chapter six, verse twelve, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was already destroyed. There was nothing to do about it anymore. More, all the flesh that was, uh, he, he had destroyed all, of it. and then God said to Noah, "Kets kol basar balafanai, the end of all flesh has come before me, and I'm destroying uh, all all human beings with the earth itself." And now you, I want you to build an ark because you I have seen as righteous before me. Um, and so God says, come you and your whole household into the ark because you I have seen as righteous before me in this generation. Now, that qualification, it in a way flattens Noah's status. He is righteous, but he's righteous in his generation. That God looks at the generation and he says, I see that you are a sort of exception. And that turned up at the beginning of our parasha as well. That a great compliment to Noah, the Torah pays a great compliment to Noah, that he was an ish tzaddik tamim. He was a, he was a perfectly righteous person. And no one gets called that, right? No one else in the whole Torah gets given such a large compliment. And so you, you want to believe that Noah was a very significant, he was tzaddik gamur. He was a really righteous person. And so for him, it was worth saving the world and keeping his, his spiritual genes to continue into a hopefully better version of a future world. But even, even in the Torah itself, you can hear the qualification on this big compliment. He was Tariq Tamim Bedorotav in his generation. And as you know, perhaps Rashi will, will interpret it in two possible ways. There are two possible interpretations of that. Either it makes him even more of a Tzadik, does it make you even more of a tzaddik if you live in a in a wicked generation and you never nevertheless manage to maintain the highest standards that would the challenge is greater and therefore you get more credit? Or is it actually putting you down if you're called righteous in your generation? That in another gener generation, God wouldn't have been very impressed with you. But as against this generation, you look rather good. And that's a way of putting Noah down. Why go that way? Why why be so mean to Noah? You know, in in the Midrashic tradition, based on the text itself, and it seems to me that there is a real question here about: Do we want the the classic myth here of the wicked and the righteous, the two opposite poles? God destroys because of all the wicked. And then at the last moment, he decides, well, sad after all, Noah really is a considerable tzaddik. So I will make an exception after all, and I will change my whole policy about the world. It will continue. Or is Noah actually a very minor tzaddik? And is the Torah in some way going to, going to pains to hint that? that he was a tzaddik, but <clears throat> why? 
why, why do that to to Noah? That's one of the questions I want to I want to raise. On what basis then does God save Noah? He wasn't such a splendid tzaddik. It's because he found favor in his eyes. Now, what do we do with that? God, to find favor in God's eyes is a great compliment. Right? That's something you do find in other places, right? Um, look at look at number on your page. If you look now at number two, a very comprehensive, large focus view of God in relation to all possible worlds. Now there is serious talk of alternative worlds in, in, in the in the realm of physics. In Kabbalah, what was God doing before he created this world? He was bore olamot umachrivam. He was creating many worlds, one after the other. Serial, a serial creator of worlds, umachrivam, and destroying them. Every world, world that God created, he would say, this one I don't like, this one I do like. Uh, of, of, of the previous worlds, he says, he says, this one I don't like, these ones I don't like, these are not, don't give me hana'a, these ones don't give me a certain sense of gratification, that this was a good creation. And when he created this world, our world, for the first time, he said, okay, you pass the quality regulation exams. Right. So, so this world got that kind of approval. But again, it's approval in terms of a kind of liking that God has. It's not simply, you might say, well, God saw that in this world there would be a lot of mitzvot would be done and, 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 and human beings that would show remarkable qualities of character. Nothing specific. It's just God gives one look at it and he says yes. Yeah, this one will do. The way that a creator does. So someone, yes, this feels right. And then the great disappointment. And then the, decide, the decision to scrap this one too. And then, Noach Matzachim. God finds a remnant of this world. Why do I use that word remnant? Does anyone, can anyone tell me from the, from the text itself? In what sense was Noach a remnant of Olam Hazeh, of the previous version of Olam Hazeh. He wasn't necessarily a brilliant exception to that world. He was a remnant of that world. Oh, well, okay, uh, uh, right uh, towards the end of the of the of the flood, we read Vayisha Er Ach Noach. Everything was destroyed by water. And what remained was just Noach, Ach, Noach, with the strange overtones of Ach, which means it somehow mitigates things. It says just Noach, you know, what that little fragment of a thing called Noach, which doesn't, he doesn't really have, there's nothing so splendid to write about him. But there he was, he was Noah. There were certain hopes and expectations around him. And what that was what was left over by Yisha'er, She'erit, which is the word that's used by the prophets later on in describing all the sufferings and exiles and destructions of us, of our people, and the hope that's held out that there will always be a She'erit, She'erit Yisrael. A remnant. And I want to hold that in the back of my mind from now on, of our minds. The idea then that that's what Noah is supposed to be. And it doesn't mean a brilliant exception. It doesn't mean someone who's going to be a role model for the rest of the world. That everyone is going to look to him with admiration and say, ah, now I understand what, 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 what is expected of us. That's not exactly Noah. He is a she'erit. Okay. Having said that, let's um, let's move on to number four. What is it that God hopes for in His relation with human beings in the world, in a workable world? 
in a world that's surviving, that's capable of surviving. Based on some of these Kabbalistic structures again, number four, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Lama nimshala tefilatan shal tzadikin ke'atar. Why are the prayers of the righteous compared to an atar? A pitchfork, it's translated in your English, or a plow. What does a plow do? What does a pitchfork do? Just as this plow, this technological product, yeah, this product that is intended to extend the power of the human hand, to overcome its weakness and its lack of power, just as this atar turns over the produce from one place to the other. Now you have to imagine the pitchfork going in deep or the plow going in deep into the soil and turning the soil over so that the depths of it come up on top and the, the surface goes down underneath. And so you are turning things over. Mahapich. There is a nehefach process here. Just as that's what the plow, what the plow does, technically speaking, so God, so the prayers of the righteous turn over the attributes of God from the attribute of anger, ragzanut, to the attribute of rachmanut. From anger to compassion. Now that's a way of talking about the classic polarities of Midat din and Midat rachamim That God has on the one hand strict just, justice, strict judgment, something severe and angry, regzanut, right? Again, very anthropomorphic, angry, even cruel, Midat zariut it's called sometimes, right? There's a certain single-mindedness about it, a force and power and destruction. And on the other hand, Midat rachmanut and suddenly the structure of God's being becomes an, an image that is like a, what a plow does in the world. What does the plow do? Like the prayers of the righteous, it turns over the qualities of God, the God's how God presents himself to the world at any particular moment. And he takes the anger that was on top and buries it down underneath and allows the mercy that was underneath to emerge on the surface. In other words, God ha has rather severe mind um, changes of mind. <laughs> that is, there are God has a, a repertoire here that ranges from one extreme to the other. What's the movement between the two? It's not necessarily that he goes towards horizont horizontally from one to the other. It's that the prayers of the righteous go in deep. They cut in deep into the soil and they bring up rich undersoil, which covers the present surface, which is all crusty and rough and harsh. And that's the action of a plow. That's what a plow does. And that's what gets destroyed physically in the world. Three tfachim, three hand breadths down of soil get destroyed. And Rashi says that's the depth that the plow goes into the earth. So you have that sense there, there of the capacity of a human being to turn things over so that something good emerges on the surface and the dark things are in some way restrained. They're, 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 they're per, turn, turned around. And the prayers of the righteous have the power to do that to the divine structure, to the way that God is disposed uh, to, towards the world. Um, perhaps it may be helpful to notice that the Russian poet, Joseph Mandelstam, talks about poetry also as a plow. Prayer is a plow, and now Mandelstam comes, and I, I don't really think he knows that midrashic idea. And he says, poetry is a plow, tearing open and turning over time. The, the poet has a longing for the words of the past, for words that no longer seem usable now. 
And yet the poet has a yearning for those, those quotations of the past that offered hope, that offered wholeness. And he, what the poet does is dig deep into language and, and I, I, I read, he turns over, tearing open and turning over time so that the deep layers of it, its rich black undersoil ends up on the surface. Mankind craves like a plowman for the virgin soil of time. Where will you find something pristine of hope and of life for the future? By the action of the poet who knows how to draw things out of the past and understand them now differently, to bring them to the surface where they become usable. They become usable now. Poetry and prayer have some of the same, something of the same power. They have the power, but what is prayer? The prayer of the righteous. That's the expression, tefillat sadikim. Uh, incidentally, the word atar, uh, atar, which means pitchfork, plow. Why is that word used here? Because it's a play on words. It's a verbal play on the verb vayetar, vayetar yitzchak. Vayetar is to pray intensively, like a plow. Uh, to pray with great intensity. And that movement, uh, which is found, it, 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 that movement uh, is there in the ordinary word for to pray or to plead. It's not so common, but it does occur a few times in the Torah. Vayetar. It occurs about Yitzchak and then about Moshe with, with Paro. Um, and so what you have here is a kind of generalization then, that the power of the power of the prayers of the righteous has something of that turning over effect, nefach. And so you have a strange paradox. You want to, to complicate things a little further. Number five, before we close in on Noah, we close in on Noah, what will we Number five, Vayiskor Elokim. Notice something very strange, and Rashi points it out, that when God is has decided to destroy the world, he is named by the name Hashem, Yudke Vavke, which usually represents compassion. Yes. Vayomer Hashem Emche et Adam. God said, I will destroy man. It's the, the name of, of compassion that's used as God decides to destroy man. It doesn't fit, it doesn't seem to work. And later when God begins to have a, 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 char a hopeful and, and a loving uh, association with the future of the world, when the waters begin to abate, we read Vayiskor Elohim at Noah. God remembered Noah and all who were with him in the ark. Why Elohim? Why not say, after all, this is a movement of chesed. This is a movement of loving kindness on the part of God. Why use the harsh word, Elohim? And Rashi, if you look at number five, puts it like this. He says, this name is the name of Midat Hadin, of the attribute of, of harsh judgment. How does it work in the structure, in the economy of God's being? We are here thinking about God in a way that's very, very strange to us. It's not, not our normal way of approaching God. The idea that God has different parts to him, and they're all part of one larger organism. But what can happen then is that at the moment that God decides to remember he remembers Noah, the idea of Noah comes up into God's mind. God is in a state of din. He's in a state of destruction. And what we see is the inversion of that state, that state changing into rachamim, la foch. That mapecha, that revolution from one state to another is what is registered here. It's not as if God suddenly finds himself in the other state and it should say Vayiskor Hashem. It's not a jolting movement from one to the other. It's a process of some kind. 
that suddenly what was strict judgment, total destruction, horror, nightmare, that was the state in which God related to the reality of the world. Suddenly, but not so suddenly actually, that there is a process that's initiated by the prayers of the righteous. They have an effect of turning things around. What was above, what was on the surface will go down underneath, like a, like a human being, yeah, a human being who is very, very angry and ready to destroy everything around him, a real anger. And then for some reason it begins to soften. And the softening process means that unconscious parts of oneself, which are loving after all, begin to come back up to the surface. Right? Gradually there's a turnaround. And I may still feel kind of annoyed at the end, but the annoyance is it's it's down there underneath. We're, we're not that's not what we're dealing with now. And so there is something of that sense of, of process. And the prayers of the righteous have a certain extraordinary effect. Uh, one more source before we close in on Noah. And here you have the basis of this idea. I think it's the first example of this idea of the prayers of the righteous. And that's about Adam himself, when God decides to create the world. Right? It's right in the process of creation. In the process of creation, God is called Hashem Elohim. That is, he has in balance the two opposite sides of himself. Somewhere there is a, a happy, there is a happy balance between the two sides. But look what happens. What do we have? Have a look at if you have a format in front of you, you can see the text, uh, the proof text in number in Perik Bed Pasuk Hay, chapter two, verse five. The second story of creation. The day that God created earth and heaven. All the vegetation of the field had not yet appeared on the earth, and all the grass of the field had not yet sprouted, because God had not brought rain down upon the earth, and there was no human being to work the earth. Now, on the face of it, on the surface of it here, we have a rather strange set of statements here. What's the, what, what's the logic here? On a certain day, the day that God finished creating, the sixth day of creation, before man was created, where was the vegetation? The vegetation should have filled the whole earth, because God had said already on the third day of creation, Totse Haaretz, Tzemach and so forth, that the earth should bring forth its vegetation. And we read there that, of course, after God said it, that's what happened. God, every, everything obeyed, creation obeyed. So why do we suddenly read here that on the sixth day of creation, actually, there was no vegetation on the surface of the earth? Nothing had grown. Why not? Because God hadn't sent rain on the earth. So in other words, almost as if, what's the point of things growing if it's not going to be nurtured by the rain? What? What? What is the logic here? And why was there no rain on the earth? Because there was no human being to work the earth. Now, what, what's the logic there? It's as if God, something goes wrong with creation. Because until there is a human being, we don't have something essential that will make the world work well. That whole organism of the world. Rashi um, on the basis of the Gemara in Chulin, says something very powerful here. He says, Terem, it had not yet appeared. Terem doesn't mean it simply, it hadn't appeared. It means it had not yet appeared. Which means, in his reading, how do you read this? That on the sixth day, when man was created, just before man was created, there's the, the, one aspect of creation is waiting for man to appear before it can appear above the surface of the earth. The vegetation did obey God, but it grew just up to the surface of the earth. So that if you looked at the surface, you couldn't see any grass. You would have thought the grass, the world would be flourishing with green um, by the sixth day. 
But no, you can't see anything. It's all hidden under the surface and it stalls there. In a way, God's commandment, right, the earth responds to God's commandment right, with a strange, okay, as if this is the way, this is what God must really want. The earth knows that when God said it should grow, <clears throat> it's to grow only as far as it can without a human being. <clears throat> what does the human being contribute to this? Adam Ayin. There is an absence of a human being. There is a nothing. There is a minus human being up to this point. What does what does the human being do according to Rashi? The human being is makir betovatan shel tzmachim. He recognizes the need of the vegetation and that the vegetation needs rain, and he knows that rain has to be prayed for. He looks at what's not there in the world. He looks at this close-shaven world, you know, the world that doesn't show a hint of the fulfillment of God's living desire. There it is bare, and he understands that there is something else that's necessary for the world, and I have to pray for it. And suddenly there is this intimate connection between the human being and the needs of the world, and the need of the need for rain and when he once he has prayed for rain then the rain falls and the vegetation grows um and and uh, and and the world can be said to be fully fully created now this <clears throat> this kind of this kind of statement gives us a sense of the main function of adam what does a human being do in the world? What makes creation possible in the world is a human being who sees what is needed, what is not there, is aware of lack, who's aware of what is not there and prays for it. That is, it talks to God, expresses his desire and his passion and his need to God. The, um, who is Noah then in the ark? Who is Noah? When he disappears from view into the, in the ark, he is someone who Midrash imagines as spending all his time, all his days and his nights feeding animals. After all, someone had to provide them with their meals exactly at the time that each animal likes to eat. So there is a sense somewhere in these, uh, in, in, the, in the Midrashic sources, that Noah, that was his tzirkut. In a way, that's how you know what a, what a tzaddik he was, because of his responsiveness to the needs of animal life. What was absent from the ark? Another midrashic understanding. There are no sexual relationships going on in the ark. And the thinking is that at a time of destruction, when God is destroying the world, you don't create. You don't create new life, aside from the issue simply of having relations, having sexual relations. No sexual relations, no children. All that, all that has, been, has been restricted, has been banned in the very expression, bo el hateva, come into that box, come into you and your sons and your wife and her daughters, separating the sexes. That's the, that's the Midrashic understanding, that coming into the box means, on the one hand, it means that the world will continue. There will be, in the end, there will be future generations of the same kind of world, but a better version of it, that there is hope for, same, the, hope for the future. So there is a certain optimism there in coming into the ark. You are a remnant. But you are a remnant who has to live under very strained conditions, very particular conditions, not the, the generating world out there, which went very wrong. There was a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, there was a big mess in that world out there in which people were relating to one another in all kinds of perverse and outrageous and violent ways. And so what you have here is a kind of sterile box. It's a box that's remaining frozen, as it were, for the future. But it does involve Noah in feeding animals, that he has to, he has to maintain the life in this, in, in this box. Have a look at the, at the next midwife on your page. 
number seven. Kohelet says, we find in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything under the sun, everything under the heavens. There's a time for everything. For instance, there was a time for Noah to go into the ark. As it says, you come into the ark, bo ata el, el hateva, you and your house. And there is a time for him to leave the ark, as we find at the end of the parsha, towards the end of the parsha, tse minateva. God says to Noah, now leave the ark. So there it's perfectly balanced. There was a time to go in, and then there's a time to go out. Viewing things as part of a larger story, that every story has a beginning and an ending. And somewhere there is that sense of a kind of rhythm of moving into a different world, which is the world of the box, which is the world of the spaceship, this, this unreal world in some way, in which Noah has a very unusual position, which the Midrash goes on to talk about. What is this like? It's like a parnas, or in the next line, uh, a sofer. What, what it basically means is an administrator, someone who is like the king's undersecretary. Um, no, no, sorry, the parnas is the person who's in charge of the kingdom. Yes, like the king, who left his own place, his own position, and he settled someone else in his position. When he came back, he said to his surrogate, now you leave your place and I'm coming to take over my place again. All right, it's, all done. it's done very kind of awkward language. Your place, my place. Um, and, uh, and when he came, yes, Sheba, he said, go out of your place. The, 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 two, the, two, the two versions are slightly uh, tangled here. So Noah, God said to him, go out of the ark. God had said, go in, and now he says, go out. And Noah, lo kibel alav latzet. He didn't, he refused to go out of the ark. Now, where does such an idea come from? That Noah refused to go out. There was a great reluctance in Noah to leave the ark at the end of that year. When the, when the waters had dried up and Noah had already knew that the, he'd sent out the dove and he knew that all was safe and so on. And then the final the final moment of the story is that God says to Noah, now leave this place. And the comparison, the analogy is to someone who left as an inferior to fill his function and went away and then one day he came back and he says now leave your place the place that you've now got used to thinking of as your place it's really my place what is this like what what, what is this what is this parable it seems that that noah there are things about life in the ark as compared to life out there that noah has come to like the fact that he is feeding the animals, the fact that he has no sexual relations, the fact that these are all midrashic contributions, um, the fact that he doesn't sleep at night, he doesn't get one night's sleep. All that now constitutes him as a godlike figure, because these same things are said of God. Of course, they are suffering for a human being not easy for a human being to fulfill these conditions but noah has got used to it right over a year he has now reduced his expectations of life on one level and on the other level he's got himself you know kind of theomanic ideas he begins to feel that he's a kind of god in this little world he is Zan Umufarnes, he feeds all living creatures. You know, there are all kinds of analogies that you can say he's in a godlike position as compared to that messy world out there. That messy world out there where you where there is connection between men and women, but look how wrong it can go. You know, we've already seen how, how badly that can be played. Where there is language, where there is there is the possibility of communication and a certain kind of softness and interaction and creativity, where things flow and there are risks and there are dangers and you can't entirely assure the future. I'd rather stay here because here I have some control. I'm in charge here. And Loki Bella Lovelace. 
Where does the Midrash get all this from? From that little word, bo and se. Bo doesn't just mean going to the ark, we said. It means no connect, no sexual relations with your wife. And therefore God says to Noah, you and your sons should go into the ark. That, that's the indication. But when God says go out of the ark, what he really means is now you reconnect with the female. Male and female reconnect with all the risks and all the and all the possible bafflements that exist when two who are different connect with each other. And God says to him, go back out into that world. And what does Noah do? He leaves and God says to him, leave you and your wife. Making it clear what is meant by that in, in, in this core idea. And what does Noah do? He leaves with his sons. Now, on the basis of that kind of coded language, you have a psychological it's a psychological uh, pathology almost that's suggested here that the desire for life, the libido of Noah has in some way been entirely disrupted. What would that involve to have that libido alive, to be a remnant that can now reconnect with a possible future world which one can't totally control? I don't know to start with with what I come out into the world, how I will connect with the world. And in fact, one has to say that the dark side of the story is that he seems to misconnect when he goes out. That there's the there's strange story of his drunkenness, that suddenly he, he loses his mind. And there is a very strange, strange story with Ham, which has all kinds of scandalous implications. Something goes very wrong sexually in, in, in that scene, which doesn't hold out great hope for the future. And here is Noah now planting himself in the ark as if it's his place now. He's content to stay in the spaceship. I'm, here I have some control. And God says to him, I want you to leave. I want you to leave here. What does God want of Noah? That's involved this idea of control. And here I'd like to bring up uh, an idea which I have been thinking about recently, about the two different ways one can pay attention to the world. There are two kinds of attention. One way has to do with what's called rather portentously di differentiation. That is, in order to have a creation, what God does is he differentiates between the sky and the earth, between the water and the sky. He places, he makes differences, Vayavdel, in order to have separate things in the world. Separate things, all kinds of details, and each detail has to work according to its own rules. Right? A complex organism is composed of dif differentiated things which are different from one another and which have to relate to one another through their difference. On the other hand, there is a de-differentiated way of looking at the world, where you kind of move back from noticing all the details. And I'm thinking now of an artist who moves back from looking at all the details of his painting. And even as he's beginning to paint, there is one detail here. What gives him the courage to keep painting? some sense of a larger being, a larger entity that he can't totally control. And so there is a sense, he can't focus entirely on the detail because he has to remain somewhere open to how this detail will now become part of, will generate a larger reality. And so you have a kind of, the way Anton Ehrenzweig puts it uh, in his book, The Hidden Order of Art, is um, he calls it an unfocused gaze. The artist looks at his work, not with a precise sense of, I know exactly where this is going to go, and then there's that detail, and that. there's a kind of open, open, blank stare, he calls it, that blurs the idea of details and allows you to see complex things taking part place in a larger organism how all that works together. How does Midat HaDin and Midat HaRachamim 
relate to each? How do they relate to each other? How do the different objects of one, or this is a kind of um, thought exercise. Um, can you see this? Can you see it? No? Not we are too close. You I see. think it would be better further away because you also have the blur in the background. Yes. How is that? Do you see it? No. Mm. It's a profile here of a face. And then if you look at this, and this is the ground, this is just the background. But then you switch and you see that this is a profile of a face looking that way. And they are divided from one another, but they're not divided from one another. There's only one line dividing them. And you can see one profile and then you can see the other profile, but you have to kind of jump between the two of them, right? That's, that is a kind of, because we're bound in a kind of rigidity and you can only see one detail at a time. So this and then there's that. What an artist can do, and you need it in order to draw this line, this one line, is the ability to, to, to back off. You said, you know, without the blur, right? To, to back off and to see how one thing becomes the other as he's doing it. As he's drawing the line, as she's drawing the line, she can see the doubleness. She can see exact without having that jolt, that, you know, that movement. There's a kind of, it, it, there's a comprehensive sense of the movement of, of the hand. I know what I'm doing and I know I'm creating two realities that in a sense can't live with each other and yet they will live with each other. Now, that sense of things, that, that's, that sense of the work of the artist has to do with an ability to be involved in the details of life, right? the artist in life, to be involved in the details as if they are everything. And yet somewhere with all the sense, and here I do think of our contemporary reality, with all the sense of the total reality of all these details, somewhere to still be open to the possibility of a larger picture. How can one do those two things at the same time? Because in a way, it's an impossibility. When it comes to Noah, Noah has decided to narrow his world to the world of the Teva. Here he's in charge. And God says to him, say, Minateva, come out into that mess of a world. Come out there. And what I need from you, actually, what God needs from Noah, is something that Noah actually is not seen to do at all. What God needs from him is, as we have said before, tfilat tzadikim. That if Noah is a proper tzaddik, then what is needed in order to bring this flood to an end is his prayer. And Noah has no prayer to offer. In this whole story, we don't see him in any sense in dialogue with God. We don't see him speaking at all. He's completely silent throughout the whole story till the very end when he curses and blesses among his children. What God wants of him in order to save the world is something that he seems absolutely to have refused. There's, some, there's nothing of, of that that he can do. What is required in that kind of prayer? Number number eight. And then God spoke to Noah saying, We're going back, back to that expression. Go out of the ark. A quotation from Tehillim. Yes. Tehillim Kuf Membet, 142, verse 8. Release, bring out my soul, my being, from prison in order to give thanks to your name, says the psalmist. That is, Midrash is taking that verse from Psalms and bringing it to the surface of the story of Noah. It's taking it out of its context and putting it in a different place. It's like the plow that's turning things over. It's taking that verse and it's saying, Noah davened. 
Noah did pray. Did pray. Eve, I'm hearing an echo. Are you hearing it? No, it's fine now. You don't hear it? Okay, good. Uh, I'll have to tolerate it. Um, what the Medrash is suggesting is that in spite of the evidence of the surface of the text, that Noah doesn't pray because he doesn't really want to leave. There's a great reluctance in him. His libido has, has gone for, for, for that kind of life risk. There is something in him that nevertheless does pray. And what it prays is in the words of the psalmist, I ask you for the possibility of gratitude. He cries out to God, I am very, very lacking. I don't have everything I want in this, in this, in this arc world. I want there to be a full world. And in order for there to be that kind of rachamim, that kind of chesed, that a full and healthy world should, should, should ensue, what is needed is the human being capable of giving thanks to God, in spite of the fact that given the reality of the present moment, you might say he has nothing to give thanks to God for. So what he's asking for is the possibility of gratitude, the possibility of seeing things in such a way as to be able to give thanks to your name. And that when the tzaddikim of the future, when they crown you, O oh God, they'll crown you through me because of me. It's a complex sentence from Psalms. Ki tigmol alai, because you will have rendered goodness to me. That is, I speak from a situation in which I recognize that this is a very, a very um, cropped life. This is a life that can't continue to be. And I want a larger, more comprehensive vision of you and your goodness to me and who am I after all. It's true that in the verse in Psalms, it seems as if what's being said is that Noah says, but all future tzaddikim will come from me. So all their praise of you will in a sense go back to me. So please let me out of here so so that I can have that generative role for the future. Or there is a, a less rosy reading, which is that Noach is saying, there will be these future tzaddikim, but they will all come from me, and I know I'm not a perfect tzaddik. I know I am very a very imperfect person, and therefore I can barely bring out this prayer and I can, it's very difficult for me in any way to glimpse what I basically want, what I, what I, what I really want. And so that when God says, go out of the ark, he's responding to that quiet prayer, to that almost impossible prayer of, of Noah, that Noah is hoping, some part of him is hoping for the possibility of gratitude, of a return to a world in which one can sense God's goodness, in which one senses the whole picture, that the whole picture is not only what we are going through now, although what we are going through now feels quite total, feels as if it's it, it, it's it's the whole story. Kitig mol alai, when we bless, when we make we make the bracha, the birkata gomel, we talk about God is hagomel lachayavim tovot. That who does God deal out goodness to? To those who are lacking, chayavim, who are not complete and whole in themselves. Perhaps the only way to pray to God, the only kind of prayer that Noah can bring out in his lips in such a situation is a prayer of unwholeness, that I'm incapable of focusing for a moment on anything. The Beit Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov Ishbitz, uh, son of the Mea Shiloach, in his commentary on Noah, says, Noah, who was not a complete tzaddik, and in that, in that sense, 
had a possibility of prayer. It's his incompleteness, his chisaron, that allows space for him to pray to God. Shikor, a sorely his pale, quotes from the Talmud, that someone who's drunk is forbidden to pray. Now, Noah is not drunk at this moment. At this moment, he is in the grips of the reality principle. He is there in the dire reality of, of his life. And that's what legitimates prayer. He's not drunk. He's not in some way euphoric about something good in his life. But he is out of that chisaron. He is crying to God, ligmol, to move towards him. He's appealing to a certain kind of intimacy with God. He's saying, I feel that you are there and that there is tov to be had from you. And that movement from lack is the movement of the prayer of those who are righteous, but not terribly righteous, you know, not exceptionally righteous, righteous in the way that any ordinary human being is righteous. With the, with, the, with the possibility of singing something better into being, of praying something better into being. Without that passion, how can God say, say min ha-teva? We've seen that with that other level of Noah's being, he's, he's reluctant to leave. There's a part of him that's reluctant, and the Midrash wants to say that there is a certain dimension in him that wants to see the whole, that wants to see at least a glimmer of the whole. And I want to finish then with God changing his mind again, yet again. At the end, Perik Chet, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, 821, God remembers, right? God remembers Noah, and God, and Noah offers a sacrifice, a sweet savor to God, and God then makes an oath, Lo Osif, I will never do it again. I will never curse the whole of life in this way. And I will never, again, the same idea of destroy. I will not curse, I will not destroy. That double lo'osif constitutes an oath. So here is God saying in words that this mabal will remain as an exception. Not something that in a way we should think about too much except in the sense of how did a future world become possible after that total destruction? And God says, lo osif. And the question that arises is, did Noah know what God had decided? Did God transmit to Noah in any way what he had decided? It doesn't say so. God said to his heart, vayomer Hashem el libo, and here at the beginning and the end of the story, we have God relating to his own heart as if you know, there are different kinds of attention. The beginning, God was saddened to his heart and gave up on the world. Meantime, there was the exception of Noah and there was Noah's prayer. And suddenly things have changed. And God says to his heart with a certain measure of acceptance now, Yetzer lev ha'adam ram and urav. Doesn't sound very, very wonderful. With a certain acceptance, God says the human heart, the indicate the inclination of the human heart is, is evil from its youth, from his and, and Rashi wonderfully plays with that word, ni urim is the energy, the, the energy that comes in when, when a baby is born. That a baby, and when a baby stirs itself to move out of the out of the womb, that energetic movement is already the movement of the Yetzahara. Right? It's innate that there is a certain evil in human beings. And that's the condition of this world. And God accepts it at this point. At this point, it's as if God has moved from the Vayit Atsev El Libo to a certain containment of that kind of perfectionism. And God says, no, I'm never going to, and here the Mea Shiloach on your page here, God and his son, the Beit Yaakov, carry on this idea. And they say, God decides it's not right. Lehit Pashet, to fulfill my own angers in this total way. 
just as it's not right for human beings to go all the way with their desires, which they were doing in the world before the flood, God comes to a kind of parallel decision himself. Lo osif, I'm no longer that kind of radical, total anger will never, will ne will never be expressed again. Does Noah know about this? In the Beit Yaakov, I didn't put it on your page, but we'll finish with this and with Rosenzweig. Um, Beit Yaakov says something like this. He says, common sense would say, if you read the passage, that Noah is grateful to God and he offers sacrifices, sweet savor to God. And that's what, in a way, initiates in God the decision never to do the to, to destroy the world again. That's how it seems to read. And the Beit Yaakov says in his very radical way, he's a very radical mystic. And he says, no, it's exactly the other way around. It's that God in, is the root of all being. Everything begins with God. Every human action begins with God. God decides in his mind, in his mind, never again. God, suddenly, there is a change, and he has a ratzon. The will, the desire of God becomes a will for life, becomes a will for kiyum ha'olam, that the world should continue existing. And that's a kind of comprehensive view of things. Human beings sense something of that ratzon. When human beings are able to come to a sense of restraint, self-restraint and desire for the continued life of the world, they are drawing on a certain root of their being. There's a certain intimate connection that they, we have with God. And it's God whom in the end is the, he is the, he is the, he is the, he is the, at the center of the story. We have suffered and God has suffered too. And now there comes a kind of movement in God which has to do with life and a movement in the remnant of the previous world. Something now will change. Have a look at Rosenzweig. We'll finish with that. Number 10, number 11. His great book, The Star of Redemption, right at the end, we find this passage. He says, all other religions, all other uh, cultures look to expand themselves. They look to become more and more. Judaism and it alone in all the world maintains itself by subtraction, by contraction, by the formation of ever new remnants. In Judaism, man is always somehow a survivor. Everyone is a survivor in Judaism, an inner something whose exterior was seized by the current of the world and carried off while he himself, what is left of him, remains standing on the shore. Something in him is waiting. And what is extraordinary about this is Rosenzweig's emphasis on Judaism as having always to do with remnants. We are always remnants, She'erit Yisrael. We are remnants of the past, and every generation, in a sense, has that, has that status. What is it to be a remnant? It's to be somehow a survivor. Look how, how, how deliberately weak his expressions are. Somehow, there's a vagueness. There is that blank stare, that, that look at a reality that you can't focus on too analytically and too clearly. There is something going on here. Man is always somehow a survivor, an inner something, undefined. There's no name for it. All the exterior parts were taken away by the movement of the world, the movement of time. They were stripped off. They were husks. What is left is something essential. It's not just a part of the whole. It's the essence of the whole. Something, And it sorts. It's a spark of the whole. And it remains something within him is waiting. That is, the Jewish human being, Rosenzweig says, has something and waits for something. There is something 
in him and her, which can't be defined, which has to do with a kind of being a remnant of the past and waiting for the future. A remnant of the past where there was revelation and a remnant for the future, uh, 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 waiting for the future, which will be salvation. And somewhere there is that attunement by this something somehow with the God who is the source of both past and future. And there's an attunement there that allows one to rise above the husks. And that involves a kind of contraction, it's a tsimtsum, of moving back down into oneself rather than out expansively into the world. And that ultimately, that is Jewish creativity. That Jewish creativity has to do with connecting with what can't be concretely and analytically defined, that something that is very alive and very capable of moving into a world of change. Um, if you have any thoughts or comments, I'll be happy to stay online. Thank you. It was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Any, Thank you very much. Any thoughts or questions? I, I'm. I'm. It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a few seconds. <laughs> you've you've given us the uh, hope from the despair we all feel. Um, the story of Noah and um, Hashem promising never to send. A flood again and um i think that we all feel hope you know we want to look for tikva but it's it's very hard to see it's all muffled right now but we we, we hope that these husks that you talk about can um somehow uh disappear in a in a better better future thank you so much thank you all thank you thank very you. much for being thank you thank you, thank you everybody thank you May, may we have good may we have good news. Amen. 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 Bye. Okay.